What's going on, everyone? You're listening to the Asian MMA Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything going on in the world of Asian MMA. This episode is brought to you by Picograms. I'm Dana Bluen, and today we're talking about all the latest news in Asian MMA. I've got to start out with the biggest news on the amateur scene, and that is the International Mixed Martial Arts Federation, IMAF, has been forced to pull their 2019 Asian Open Championships out of China. The good news is this is going to be landing here in Bangkok. So they've already announced they're taking it out of China. They're bringing it to Bangkok, which is fantastic. They're going to announce the new date soon. I'm going to try to actually get an interview with Ply. I'm going to reach out to him this week. He's the president of the Thai Mixed Martial Arts Federation, TMAF. I want to get his take on it, but I'm sure he's super excited. Now, one of the things I need to point out here is that IMAF has actually faced these bureaucratic issues with MMA in China in the past. It's nothing new, and I think that's really what's caused this whole sort of issue with amateur MMA, with MMA in China. And look, let's be honest, that's a market that everyone wants to tap into, but there are some barriers to entry that people are still trying to figure out. Even the UFC and One Championship have struggled with going into China at different points, setting up shows there, getting sanctioned, regulations, dealing with bureaucracy with red tape. There's a reason they both spend a considerable amount of time, effort, and money in that market, despite the fact that there's all these barriers to entry and that it's so difficult to do business there, to put on a show there. That being said, super excited to have the IMAF Asian Open Championships here in Bangkok, in Thailand, Obviously, I'll be trying to cover as much as that as possible. Asian MMA will be all over that. You know, like I said, I'm going to try to talk to Ply. I'll try to reach out to Kareth Brown, get an interview with him. Very exciting times. Be be on the lookout for more info for that for sure. Now, over the weekend, this is something interesting. We saw the Abu Dhabi Warriors 5 take place in, well, Abu Dhabi. Now, I think the biggest sort of fights on there was that we saw UFC vet uh, Ali Thompson get a second round stoppage against Cage Rage vet Roman Weeb uh, via TKO. Now, another notable fight on that card was UFC vet Rolando Dai out of the Philippines, who also pulled the second round stoppage via TKO. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting about Abu Dhabi Warriors is that this was their fifth outing, right? This is their, their fifth one, but this is their first event since 2016. Now, it's unfortunate, but this type of promotional inactivity is a common thread across Asia. You know, I think in the U.S. too, it's not unique to Asia, but it's something that really hurts the scene here because there's just not as many promotions And look, that comes down to the fact that the economics of the fight game are very difficult to figure out. And not everyone can make it work, especially as a smaller promotion who has other considerations. Even one of the most popular uh, promotions here in Thailand, FMD, is essentially shuttered after their last show, which was over a year from their previous show. Because it's a tough game. It's a tough business to be in. You know, not everyone can figure out a way to make a viable promotion that's sustainable, that is a cash-positive business, a profitable business. Now, they had a really good turnout at Abu Dhabi Warriors 5. Um, They haven't announced another show, but I saw some reports where the promoters were looking at it and thinking that it was a promising turnout. So hopefully they look at this, they see, okay, hopefully they made some money. I, I really would like to see that. And now they say, well, we'd like to do more shows. We'd like to have a bigger year and really try to make a run at this. That would be amazing. One of the things that I love about the Middle Eastern shows is that it does give us an other venue for people out of Asian MMA to get into the Middle East. You know, technically, it's still sort of Asia as a continent. And, but we see a lot of the Southeast Asian fighters be able to get the opportunity to fight in the Middle East. And that sort of puts them on a bigger stage and gets them a little bit closer to the Western markets or just on, on a bigger promotion in general. So hopeful, I'm hopeful. Let's see what happens. You know, but obviously I've, I've got to be realistic that any promotion, you know, medium, small promotion is going to struggle. We've got to wait to see if the economics make sense. 
you know, I, I've seen a lot of great promotions come and go. The amateur tournament uh, MEMA in Malaysia, Malaysian Invasion, fantastic tournament, ran for five years, and you know, essentially it looks like there will be no more because without a major sponsor, it doesn't make financial sense. And that was this great, fantastic grassroots organization that produced some fantastic fighters. You know, by the same token, I, I'm reminded of Primal FC down in Phuket. And, you know, the guys who put that one on, they put a fantastic show conceptually. They put a great card together. You know, of course, there were some production mishaps. It was their first show ever, but it was a, it was a great product and incredibly marketable. I mean, they, they put that one together with an eye for marketing a show to put something together that was sellable and still couldn't make it happen. So it's a tough game, and it, it saddens me when I see these opportunities for fighters become less and less outside of big promotions, especially in Asia where there, there's just not a ton of options on the local level. So the, the more we can see, the better. Now, with that being said, I've got to move on to one championship, Heroes Ascent in Manila over the weekend. This, this was a good card. I mean, it wasn't a great card. And like I said, that I said this in a previous episode that I don't think they're going to have any great cards until Tokyo that sort of coming out party for Demetrius Johnson, Eddie Alvarez, and for their, their launch in Japan, which is a huge move, huge move for one championship. That being said, you know, the one thing, we, we did see the, the first round of that lightweight Grand Prix here. I'm going to talk about that at a later time. I don't want to get into it now because I want to do a whole thing on the Grand Prix, where we stand. You know, they, they snuck it in here on us in the Philippines, sort of give it a, the card a, a little bit more panache, but good card, not a great card. Main event, would have, it was a great fight. The main event was a fantastic fight. Five-rounder, back and forth. You know, in, in that main event, we saw uh, the challenger, former champion, Adriano Mores, face off against the champ uh, from the Philippines, from Team Lakai, Gigi, and... You know, I, I really had this going I, into the the final round. I, I really thought that the champ had it. You know, I looking at my scorecard, the way I did it, to me, the champ was going to, you know, come away, you know, and still. You know, I think a lot of people thought that. Everyone who I watched the fight with was in that same mindset. A lot of people I've talked to since were in that same mindset that he pulled it off. He definitely defended and, you know, the decision comes out, and we hear, and new. And by unanimous decision, nonetheless, which is puzzling, but, you know, and I, I don't want to go off on one, because one does a lot of great things. One's a fantastic promotion. If you're a fan of Asian MMA, you're, by default, a fan of one championship. They have some of the biggest fights, some of the best fights in Asia right now. I would argue, hands down, the biggest, most dominant organization in Asia and probably the organization globally with the most meteoric, meteoric rise right now. They're, they're really outpacing a lot of other people in growth. But I think back to their judging over the past couple of years, I've taken issue with a lot of one's judging. And I'll say right out, I'm not a fan of the way they do it. They judge the fight as a whole as opposed to round by round yet they still have fighters fight in rounds. Look, it's not a street fight, it's a sport. Fighters fight in rounds for a reason. To score it otherwise doesn't make sense to me. Now, I'm not saying the 10-point must system that the UFC uses is fantastic. It, it by no means is great. It's a flawed system, but it's so much better than this judging it by a whole, judging it as a whole fight. I don't think it works. And we see that. And I think back, the most recent fight, other than the fight we saw in Manila last weekend, was the Angela Lee May Yamaguchi fight from 2018, their second fight. I was in press row for that. I was in the press section. And everyone who I was sitting with, hands down, thought that May Yamaguchi just handed Angela Lee her first loss, took the championship away from her. It, it was, I, I, I've rewatched that fight a number of times. I can't see it any other way. And it, then they announced the decision. For Angela, a unanimous decision. And you know, that, that blows my mind. And I, I don't know how this happens. I, I'm, not, I'm obviously not an insider with one championship. I don't have all the details on their judging, but I know they judge it as a whole fight. They don't judge it round by round. 
And, and I think that hurts the sport more than anything. And it, it leads to these types of decisions where it leaves us scratching our head and there's not a lot of transparency there. Now, now I know there's a lot of back and forth on the whole commission thing. There's no commissions here in Asia. And there have been times where one has reversed decisions. You know, most of the time, you know, I, I agree with them when they reverse something. But, you know, again, the lack of transparency about how it happens is concerning. That being said, I, I don't want to get too much into it. It's a conversation for another day. I don't want to dog one. I just, I want to point out that I, I just think that that decision was bull. And, but, but it is what it is. It happened. Now, if you guys actually want to see me do a whole episode on judging criteria here in Asia and how it works and, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly of judging and officiating in Southeast Asia, Asian MMA, let me know and I'll, I'll probably do something like that in the future. Lastly, lastly, and this is just in super fanboy news, total fanboy of uh, the legend, the Gracie killer, Sakuraba is going to hit the mats. Uh, for Quintet Fight Night 2 to do a su submission grappling match February 3rd. Now, now look, who doesn't want to see Sakuraba do something? Who doesn't want to see him come back and do just about anything? I mean, look, if he came back and did an ice cream eating contest, I would pay for that pay-per-view just to watch it. I don't even care because he's that much of a legend. Uh, in MMA in gen general, not just Asian MMA, not just Japanese MMA, not just the Pride Days. In general, he is an MMA legend. Now, that's all I have to say about that. Now, to stay up to date with all things Asian MMA, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and Facebook. I'll have all the links in the show notes. Check it out. Check it out.